Can I get a little more coffee before we start? Is that okay? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Josh Bryant. I'm from South Lake, Texas. It's a suburb of Fort Worth. Yo, I was the youngest American to bench press 600 pounds. Since then, I've actually had one of my uh, students break it. I think with my style of training, one of the things, some of the things I utilize on the bench press is first off, a very individualized approach. So it's gonna be like the frequency, the types of exercises and all that type of stuff's gonna be dictated toward the individual. There's not like an overarching, you know, Josh Bryant type of plan that at one size fits all. So the first one we're going to talk about is uh, Jeremy Hornstra, who in my opinion is the, the best bench presser of all time when you factor in, you know, how much, because you look at him, he's actually competitive on a super heavyweight type of level. He's, he's bench pressed 675, for not, and it's all time world record at 275, but without making a cut, he was about 260 pounds when he did that. Then he's all time world record at 242 with 672, and he recently set the all time world record at 220 at uh, 601 but it was actually broke the next day so it's holding three different all-time world records and in, in the modern era that doesn't really happen so some of the stuff we did differently from kind of what he was doing before is we talked a little bit about frequencies individualized so with jeremy one thing i got him going is he'll go um he goes two bench days a week one of them's gonna be his heavier bench press day the other one's either gonna be sometimes we'll rotate like more speed bench presses other times more like close grips but it's not quite as heavy as an accessory day where he also hits his shoulders. So some of the key things I think that have helped Jeremy initially was um, really building his drive off his chest with an exercise called the dead bench press. Integrating in um, you know some heavy dips and things like that helped him a lot. And then also, um, he used to call it deloading, now I call it reloading because it's a more proactive approach, but taking where we go three heavy weeks on, one heavy week with um, not so much volume and intensity, just kind of back it off a little bit but that gave him a chance to you know, perfect his technique and things like that. So that's been um, huge for, for Jeremy. And I also think, um, you know, also another exciting thing is Jeremy's actually gonna be doing a full meet in August. So that will be pretty exciting to see how he does there. But um, yeah, in my opinion, Jeremy's the, the best bench presser of all time. Besides like, just practical experience because I've been, you know, you got to look at where I started out. Um, when I was um, in high school, my first like real job besides like seasonal type of Christmas stuff when I was 16, I, I was managing a hardcore gym. So I got to be around all these great lifters, place where Ed Cohn and those type of people came through. And then I also, um, I also um, just did it myself. So from there, I kind of, you know, I'm growing up in this, seeing it, being around, you know, Dr. Salaria, Dr. Fred Hatfield, people like that. And then I got to, you know, do it myself. So I've never, like, I'm not like a career change of like, I didn't like at, you know, 27 years old, have a mental breakdown doing stocks and got into this. This is all I've ever done. So I think a lot of it's experience because experience doesn't necessarily dictate competency. You could be like, I mean, I've seen some high school coaches that have been in it for 30 years. It's like they've gotten worse over time. So, but I think, you know, actually learning from your experiences and then coaching so many people. So all the people I've trained, you know, I coach, if they're, um, it's not like I've like, got like a team of people that are doing this for me. Like, you know, they email me, then I got like some secret team, like they're communicating, it's all with me. So when you look at doing this over, you know, 20 years, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of people. So I'm, I think I just get all that feedback and stuff. And I've, I noticed certain things that other people wouldn't notice just because of experience and actually like keeping records of things. So that's a huge part about it. And then it's also, I think, not being married to one individual way of doing it. So for instance, Julius Maddox and getting a 705, he did it um, in a meet, then he did it again at the Arnold a couple weeks later. So we went initially from bench pressing twice a week to now he's bench pressing like every 10 days. A second day, accessory day, he does, um, push-ups okay so like that's sort of one thing people would you know, might take issue with like saying you know I've heard people say the ideal frequency is like X amount of times a week where there's no way that's gonna be true so I don't have like I said like a Josh Bryant type of method I just do what works for the person I think since I'm you know kind of a whore for results and that's all I care about that's why it works 
So I think it's just dictating to what the individual needs and realizing everybody's not the same. James Strickland has um, become one of the best bench pressers in the world, and I think he'll set the all-time world record at 308 here pretty quickly. And he's actually about to do a full meet too, and go 2100. But um, one of the some of the biggest things I think we've changed with his training is uh, James is very intense, committed individual. But I mean, I remember seeing him at meets over and over and over. He probably tried 600, you know, I don't want to exaggerate, but at least 15 times before he got it. So what the problem was is it was very random. One day when I was actually training, you know, Big, Big Al Davis, he's another um, big bench presser, 670 raw. We were at the G Metroflex in Arlington and um, James showed up there and I talked to him at a couple meets and it was, it was odd because it's, he's, he's from Houston. So, you know, Texas is big. So that's like, you know, real far apart from where we're at in Fort Worth area. And anyways, he showed up and uh, talked to him a little bit and then thought he was gonna start, he didn't. Then he started after that. And I think what some of the biggest changes we made is James was always, I think because of his uh, intense personality and just um, because he's, you know, real hard worker and everything he does. I think w one of the issues was he was always going heavy. Like there was like no sort of like peaking or anything. It was just perpetual. Let's go as heavy as you can, you know, type of thing. I'm gonna go to every single meet that's in the area. I'm gonna go to the nationals here, there, everywhere. So what we did initially is back him way off and really get some volume work in, some rep work and kind of um, built, you see his physique's more from built that good hypertrophy base in the off season and start hitting, you know, stuff, not just, you know, I'm gonna go in, bench press to a heavy single, take three hours to do it, but actually got them on timed rest intervals, things where we're going, you know, you know, eight sets of five with a 120 second break, like someone like never trained before, supersetting that with seal rows and really started to build his physique up build him up in the right muscles and it gave him a chance to also back off the heavy rate, mentally recharge him as well as physiological of course. And then um, he ended up hitting 633 in a full meet after that. Now he hit uh, 661, that was a pretty cool meet there because Jeremy uh, hit 672, the all time world record. James hit 661 which was like a 28 pound PR. When you're at that level that's huge because you know, people are you know fighting for table scraps on a two and a half pound PR. So. That was huge. And then um, Julius Maddox also hit the 661 there. And um, he got out of the groove on his third attempt at 688. But I mean, that would meet, he was ready to go 700 too, just didn't quite work out. I think the, be I think the, the best way to increase your strength potential is by adding size. So even like bodybuilders that are like quote unquote weak, you know, they don't, they're not trained to be strong, but I guarantee you get them on an eight week program for strength, you're gonna see some serious gains there. So I think muscle mass is extremely important to gain strength. And I think also you just can't keep training that way. Cause I, I mean, on paper, you know, like saying you're doing, you know, on bench, you're elite bench presser, you do, you know, three sets of eight at 500 pounds. It, even though it's way more volume than doing a single at 700. It's not gonna be as taxing as doing a single at 700, regardless of what anybody says. So that's kind of where you get that experience in the field of, you know, not of just not just going off a textbook, but yeah, you know, like doing a single at 700 is gonna require like a Zen-like focus and, and just a, a CNS strain where you know what I'm talking about the volume work also gives you a break from that. Plus, it's gonna add you the hypertrophy. So the key is just being able to properly apply that because I think there's been sort of a trend in the last few years to you know just go heavy all the time on the same lifts and uh, this isn't olympic lifting so yeah there is an of course there's an element of technique but there are people with quote unquote bad technique that still lift a lot where you don't see somebody in a clean and jerk set a world record that doesn't look good doing it they look real good doing it so this is a skill but not as high of a level of skill so it doesn't have to be practiced all the time as heavy as you would in olympic lifting One accessory um, movement that seems to have done dividends for most people that have done it is a dead bench press in the, in the power rack. So just, you know, set the bar anywhere, anywhere from like a half inch to a couple inches off your chest, depending on how your lungs are, because, how long your arms are, excuse me. Because the only advantage a tall person has in the bench press is they have longer arms so that creates a longer eccentric, which, is gonna be, which you're going to store elastic by energy, getting more spring off the bottom. So if you're taller, longer arm, you have to start it a couple inches off 
versus you got a big barrel chest and short arms can be more close to your chest. But that movement, dead bench press has been huge for a number of lifters. And another key to remember when you do the dead bench is you want to do it for singles. So, you know, it's not like you're going to build up sets of five because the whole point is you want to eliminate the negative. So if you start doing multiple reps, even if you pause it for a second, you probably after a second pause gonna have 50% of that elastic leg energy still stored in your muscles ready to recoil and help you lift more and that you're defeating the purpose. So you want to do singles and the way you do that is progress with, um, you know, sets, you know, you might do more or less sets, vary the rest periods, things like that. Another good accessory movement we actually got from you guys was um, the Spoto Press. So that helps you keep, that's, you know, a tremendous amount of tension so you just stop. I mean, you watch when Eric Spoto set the world record, everybody's sort of like, you know, you know, circle jerking behind the keyboard saying he had no chance to, to get it because he doesn't actually touch his chest. Well, obviously he got it and he bench pressed 700, I think, like two or three weeks prior to that in, in Las Vegas. Point being, he kept stopping about an inch off his chest. So that's, okay, what that forced him to do is stay tight and create all that, that maximal tension. And again, that's one of those things that, like, it's gonna be pretty hard to find somebody that couldn't benefit from that. Because we can talk about, you know, other ones that have helped a lot of people is dips, but there's a lot of people that can't do dips because of shoulders, elbows, and a lot of times, guys with real long arms don't do as well with them, things like that. But I think the dead bench and the Spoto bench press are pretty much gonna help anybody increase their bench press at some point in their training. Yeah, so with bench form, a lot of the guys that are coming to me already have a technique that works for them because I'm generally not like, you know, hey, this is like joke off the street. He's never bench pressed before. You're gonna show him how to do it. They generally already have some kind of built-in form, and unless there's something out of whack, we're gonna we're gonna stick with what's working. But definitely, absolutely, because you gotta look at a lot of variables. Because even things like, for instance, if you're um, if you're a three lift lifter, let's say you get a big arch and all of a sudden your deadlift's down 100 pounds because your back's so sore from arching that much, but it only increased your bench press 10 pounds. Well, that's dumb because your net loss of 90, 100 minus 10. So you gotta like look at all these different variables and absolutely it'd be, um, absolutely the bench technique would be adjustable to the individual for sure. I think uh, rest and recovery are extremely important because um, especially in what we're doing here with powerlifting because um, it's not like it's not as it's not as technical as Olympic it's technical but not as technical as Olympic lifting so there's a huge equation of, of we are looking at brute strength and you need to have that brute strength you need to be recovered it's not just like dialing in a very complex skill over and over. <laughs>